Margaret Ann Anderson. You are charged on an indictment containing one count of endeavoring maliciously and advisedly to seduce soldiers from their duty and allegiance contrary to Section 1 of the Incitement to Disaffection Act 1934. The particulars of which being that on divers dates between 25th June and September the 26th, last year at 3 Ibstock Road, Fulchester, you did maliciously and advisedly endeavor to seduce soldiers, namely Peter Ridley and William Waxlow and others unnamed who are then serving in Her Majesty's forces from their duty and allegiance to Her Majesty. How say you, Margaret Ann Anderson, are you guilty or not guilty? How say you, Margaret Ann Anderson, are you guilty or not guilty? I am not guilty. Yes, Miss Travers. May it please your lordship, I appear for the prosecution in this case, and my learned friend, Mr. Padmore, appears on behalf of the defendant. My lord, as your lordship knows, a case of this kind cannot be brought without permission of the Director of Public Prosecution, so perhaps I yes, should... Thank you, Miss Travers. <sighs> Members of the jury, this is a mere formality. Please don't concern yourselves with it. I take it that you've seen this, Mr. Uh, Padmore? Uh, yes, thank you, my lord. <laughs> Members of the jury, the accused, as you have heard, Margaret Ann Anderson, is charged with endeavouring maliciously and advisedly to seduce soldiers. The prosecution feel that the evidence is both clear and straightforward, and I now call as the first witness for the Crown, Chief Inspector David Griffiths, please. I swear by Almighty God the evidence I give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, David Lloyd Griffith, Chief Inspector, Fulchester Police, uh, B Division, my lord. Chief Inspector, on the evening of September the 30th last, did you go to number 3 Ibstock Road? Uh, 3A it was actually, uh, my lord. They're flats, you see. 3A is the ground floor flat. Thank you, Chief Inspector. I'm much obliged to you. So, as you say, you went to 3A, Ibstock Road, and will you tell the court in your own words, please, what happened there? Uh, but please, my lord, may I refer to my notes? Uh, they were made contemporaneously. Uh, I have no objection, my yes, lord. Yes, please, Chief Inspector. Oh, thank you, my lord. Well, I rang the doorbell, and after a short interval, the door was opened by a fair-haired man of approximately 27 years of age, wearing a sports shirt and green trousers, whom I now know to have been the Lieutenant Ridley of the 1st Battalion, Her Majesty's Royal Darsham Fusiliers. Well, I identified myself to him, my lord, and I asked him if the flat was the residence of the accused, Margaret Ann Anderson. He replied that it was. I asked him if uh, I could see her. Well, he said, she's just gone up to the moon, but she'll be back in a minute. You can come in and wait if you like. Well, I accepted uh, the invitation, uh, my up lord. Up to the moon, uh, Chief Inspector? Oh, sorry, my lord, the golden moon. It's a Chinese takeaway food restaurant on the corner of Ipstock Road and uh, Broad Hill, my lord. I see. Thank you. Please continue, Chief Inspector. Yes. Well, I accepted the invitation, my lord, and uh, he showed me into the sitting room, which was at the rear of the premises overlooking the garden. I sat down on the settee. He remained silent uh, for a few moments, and then he said, Look, if it's me that you're after, I'll not give you any trouble. I'll come with you right away now. Um, what did that mean to you, Chief Inspector? It meant that he was absent without leave from Her Majesty's army, my lord, and that he had been posted as a deserter. And was it he that you were after, to use his own phrase? Uh, no, not at that time. Uh, not particularly, no. Yes. Then, uh, please go on. Well, then, approximately uh, seven minutes later, uh, the woman whom I know to be the accused appeared. I told her who I was and uh, that I had a warrant for her arrest and that I would like her to accompany me to the police station. She was carrying in her right hand a brown paper bag. I asked her what was in it. She didn't answer. She just handed it to me to, to show me what was in it. I could see it contained tin foil containers with cardboard lids. Yes. Which on closer I'm inspection... I'm sure we can I... pass on without a detailed menu, Chief Inspector, and say simply that it was Chinese food. <laughs> yes, a lot. 
Well, then the accused said, uh, well, let's not waste it. Why don't we all three have a quick nosh? Uh, which I was given to understand was referring to the Chinese takeaway food portions, my lord, which are considerably larger than can be consumed. Yes, by well, I'm sure we've all had Chinese takeaway meals at some time or another, eh, Chief Inspector? Uh, yes, my lord. Well, I, uh, I declined this invitation, my lord, and then I informed the accused of the offence uh, that she was going to be charged with. I also told her that I had a warrant to search the premises and to seize anything I thought was uh, evidence. Well, she didn't object to this, my lord. Uh, so my colleagues and I... Uh, uh, your colleagues, Chief Inspector? I, I think we've had no previous mention of them, have we? Oh, but sorry, my lord. Uh, I had four plain clothes officers in a car uh, near the house uh, in Ipstock Road. Now, there were three colleagues in a vehicle in Walpole Road, uh, which is a, an adjacent side street, my lord. And I had three colleagues um, at the back of the premises in Bramfield Lane. And some of them joined you in searching the flat? Uh, six, my lord. Uh, my two colleagues and I remained in the sitting room uh, with the accused and Lieutenant Ridley. Did you find the material which is to be presented as evidence in this case? Oh, yes, indeed, my lord. We found 20 to 30 books and uh, publications of a subversive nature. We also found 20 copies of a hand-printed bill informing uh, members of Her Majesty's uh, yes, arm... Chief Inspector, His Lordship and the members of the jury will be seeing it in a few moments, so there's no need to go into detail. And uh, what else? Anything else? Ah, uh, yes, there was what uh, printers called uh, a mock-up of a leaflet, uh, giving information to deserters from Her Majesty's army of where and how uh, they could get assistance. Uh, there was also a handwritten note, which was the basis of another leaflet, uh, urging deserters to bring their arms and ammunition with them. And may the witness be given the agreed bundle of exhibits. Yeah. There are copies for the jury, my lad. Now, Chief Inspector, will you look at exhibit one, please? This is what you referred to first, the printed handbill of which you found 20 copies? Uh, yes. Members of the jury, the text is, as you see, only brief. You will have ample time to examine the copies of it that you have. And what you described as the printer's mock-up, that is Exhibit 2? Yes, it is. And the handwritten note is Exhibit 3? Yes, indeed it is. All these items, they were all found on that occasion at the same time on the evening that you and your colleagues went to search the accused's flat? Uh, they were indeed, my lord. Yes. Thank you, Chief Inspector. Uh, Chief Inspector, you've told us that you went to the defendant's flat that evening with a posse of policemen. But between you... Oh, I don't know that it was a posse. I mean, I've always thought of a posse as a group of cowboys. Well, the Oxford English Dictionary defines a posse as a body of constables. But perhaps you're not familiar with that work in your part of the country. Uh, with respect, sir, I do take objection to that remark. It was rather unnecessary, Mr. Padmore. In that case, I withdraw it, and I apologise, my lord. Uh, so let us say, Chief Inspector, that you were accompanied by a body of constables, shall we? And all of you inserting the flat found no other seditious leaflets or handbills, apart from those we've heard about? I mean, no others hidden away? Oh, yes, as I said, we found 20 to 30 highly seditious books. Uh, uh, just one moment, Chief Inspector. I'm sure you know better than this. I said leaflets and handbills, by which I meant material like that in your hand of the kind produced as exhibits, not printed books with the covers on. No, sir, we did not. And anyway, these books to which you refer, uh, they were not hidden. They were all openly on the bookshelves in the sitting room, were they not? Oh, yes, they were on shelves, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily say openly. I mean, some of them were very low down on the bottom shelves, uh, but behind Spencer, the city. They, they included such books as the anarchist cookbook towards the citizens' militia and what about the barder meinhof gang, to name but three? Well, I believe those were some of them, yes. Books that could be obtained from any public library? Oh, they definitely weren't from a public library, my lord. I mean, most of them were new books, without any labels uh, or anything Chief on Inspector, them. Inspector, I wasn't suggesting that they were. Only that... Oh, well, let's move on. Uh, may the witness be shown this book, please? Uh, my lord, my learned friend has had a word with me about it, and I am content that the witness should be shown it. Yeah. My lord, it is a biography of Ernesto Guevara, more commonly known as Che Guevara. And Chief Inspector, would you turn to the marked page 112, please? 
And would you look at the paragraph in the middle, printed in smaller type than the rest? Do you see what I mean? Yes, I do, sir. And will you now compare it, please, with the copy of the handwritten note you have, the one calling on deserters to bring their arms and ammunition with them when they desert? They are identical in wording, are they not? Well, they appear to be, sir, yes. They are, Chief Inspector. Exhibit 3 is a copy of a leaflet Che Guevara addressed to the troops of the dictator Batista when they were in pursuit of Fidel Castro's guerrillas in Cuba. It would seem to be, yes, sir. Uh, you will note, I hope, that that copy is from a public library, freely available for anyone to read. You wish to re-examine, Miss Travers? Uh, no, thank you, my lord. Oh, in that case, thank you, Chief Inspector Griffiths. You may leave the witness box. And perhaps you would better ensure that the library book is returned before you're fined for keeping it too long. Hey, Mr. Padmore. I call the prosecution's next witness, please, Lieutenant Colonel Anderson. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. What is your name, please? Walter Herbert Meredith Anderson. And are you the commanding officer of the 1st Battalion Royal Darsham Fusiliers, stationed and resident at Milton Hampton, Fulchester? I am. Colonel Anderson, let us have this quite clear at the outset, shall we? You are here giving evidence for the prosecution in a case in which the accused is your own daughter. Yes, I am. Colonel, is the accused your only child? <clears throat> yes. Yes, now, I had a son of 19 years, but he was killed last year in a road accident. Yes. And does your daughter live with you and your wife? No. After she returned from university two years ago, she expressed a wish to live in a flat on her own, or rather with a friend of hers. So I, I gave her financial assistance to do that. And it was, indeed it is, in Fulchester? Yes. Which meant that you and your wife still saw her quite frequently at your home. She came as a rule at least once a week, I should say, to our house. Though of late, well, to be frank, latterly, my wife saw more of her than I did. She, I believe, avoided coming when I was there. Now, do you remember one particular date last summer when she came, Colonel? On the evening of the 25th of June. Yes. Why do you remember that particular date? We had a garden party. It was my birthday. And do you remember among the guests anyone in particular who was there? Yes, young Ridley. Peter Ridley. Now, uh, he was one of the officers under your command at Milton Hampton. Yes, I knew him well and I liked him. Thought he had a bright future ahead of him, which is why I introduced him to my daughter. Now, to my deep regret, I must add. Oh, Colonel, I know this must be hard for you, but if you would just confine yourself in your answers to the questions that I ask you, would you? Now, anyway, as a result of your introducing Peter Ridley to your daughter, did something subsequently transpire? They became lovers. Oh, oh dear. really? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Miss Travers, I'm surprised. Well, lad, I must apologize to my learned friend. That was not at all the answer I intended to elicit. Mm. I'm sure your lordship will instruct the jury to ignore it. Colonel, what I was trying to establish was no more than that uh, Peter Ridley and your daughter, as a result of your introducing them, became friends and met subsequently on several occasions to your certain knowledge at your own home. They did, and many times at her flat as well, where he was in the habit of... Uh, habit Colonel, of... just answer the question, please. Now, knowing Ridley as you did, and having regarded him as a young soldier with a bright future, did you notice any change in him after he'd become friendly with your daughter? A deplorable change. He actually came into my office one morning with a leaflet calling on soldiers not to fight, and said that just he... Just a minute. Miss Travers, it would be safer not to continue in this manner. We're going to have trouble with hearsay. Yes, my lord. Let us then just stick to your daughter, the accused, Colonel. Do you recall a conversation you had with her one Sunday at your home towards the end of September? The 26th September. Where again, you remember the date exactly because... It was my wife's birthday. Can you tell us what the gist of that conversation was? 
Yes, I told her I never wished to see her set foot in my house again. Why was that? What had she said? She said, Peter's grown up. He's not going to play silly little boys' games anymore. Mm, what did she mean by that, Colonel? That Lieutenant, that Ridley was going to refuse to continue serving in the army and was not going to obey my orders or anyone else's. Which indeed is what happened. The very next day. As soon as I saw him in the barracks next morning, he came straight up to me and said no, that he... No, no, Colonel. Thank you. Colonel Anson, you will forgive me, I'm sure, but... Some people would find it quite extraordinary, would they not, that a father should get evidence in the prosecution of his own daughter? I'm a soldier, sir. I took an oath of allegiance to my queen and country. Which supersedes allegiance as a father to your own family? Oh, really, my lud. The witness is not on trial. I don't see why his attitude should be called to account. My lord, with respect, I'm more than ready to maintain the correctness of it to anyone and in any circumstances. In fact, your wife has separated from you over this matter. My lud! Well, surely that doesn't discredit the witness, Miss Travers. It shows the strength of his convictions. Not that it's evidence, is it, Mr. Patmore? My lord. Colonel Anderson, in your evidence you mentioned that Peter Ridley showed you a leaflet. And may he be shown Exhibit 1, please? Is that handbill of the leaflet which Ridley gave you? Yes, I'm fairly sure it is. Uh, Colonel, I would like you please to be very careful in answering this question. Answer it in no more than a single word. Yes or no, please. The question is this. Did Ridley tell you where he obtained that handle? Well... And I do not want you to add anything else he might have said. No, but I'd seen one before. No, 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 My no, own no, daughter, Jeremy. Now, now, please. Oh, I... I'm sorry. I beg your pardon, sir. Colonel, do you know what a pacifist is? Yes, sir. Someone who refuses to defend their country. Well, Colonel, I think that is a somewhat inaccurate description, is it not? I mean, a pacifist, more correctly, surely, someone who does not believe in the use of force to achieve any end. Wouldn't you agree that was nearer to it? I'm not in the habit with mixing with that kind of people, sir, so I can't say with any certainty what wild ideas they have. But your daughter is a pacifist. You've surely talked about the subject with her. My daughter is a communist. Oh? Is she? She is anti-government, anti-the state, anti-authority. She wants to see all our nuclear defences abandoned and us all to throw up our hands in surrender and allow the Soviets to take over Europe and the whole world. That is your seriously considered appreciation of her views, is it? Sir, I have seen a photograph of my daughter on the front page of a newspaper carrying an anti-nuclear banner in a street demonstration. Well, Colonel, she's hardly accepted of that. Several million are doing it all over Europe. She is a traitor to her family's traditions to her country and to her queen. Colonel, one of the British Army's traditions is to protect people's rights to have their own views, isn't it? Well, Colonel, I think we're not going to get much further, you and I. So thank you. We leave it at that. I don't wish to re-examine, my lad. Oh, in that case, thank you, Colonel Anderson. You may leave the witness box. No, Colonel. Remain in court, if you will. I call Mr. Peter Ridley. And this conversation between you and the accused would be when, Mr. Ridley? I'm sorry, I can't give you an exact date. Um, possibly towards the end of July sometime. Well, you had, of course, many conversations between you, you and the accused. Oh, yes. And summing up, if you had to use one word, what was your reaction to her? Well, uh, I, suppose I'd, I suppose I'd have to say I was bedazzled. You were very much in love with her. I, I thought I was at the time, yes. Mm. Now, this leaflet, Exhibit 1, you will appreciate how important it is, so I'm sure that you'll think carefully before you answer. Now, the first time you ever saw it, it was at the flat of the accused, was it? Yes. It calls on members of the armed forces to do three things in particular, does it not? Not to fight, to disobey orders, and to desert. Yes, it does. Mr. Ridley, as a serving soldier who'd been in the army for about a year or thereabouts, and who had taken an oath of allegiance to his queen and his country, would it ever have occurred to you, do you think, if you had not met the accused, and if you had not, as you aptly 
put it, become bedazzled by her, would it ever have occurred to you to do the things you did? Namely, to tell your commanding officer you were not going to fight. You were going to disobey orders and desert the army. No, never. It most certainly would not. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Ridley. Mr. Ridley, it would be true to say that you are present very much in a mess, are you not? You are without work, have been found guilty of desertion by a court-martial, and have been sentenced to dismissal from the army by that court. Your discharge papers carry that sentence, and consequently your job prospects are grim. Isn't that so, Mr. Ridley? Yes, it is. Now, you claimed on a number of occasions, and, and not least during your court-martial, that what you did was done entirely under the influence of the defendant, Margaret Anderson, because you were so helplessly in love with her. Yes, that's true, yes. Had you never been in love with anyone before? Uh, not in that way, no. I'm sorry. Forgive me, but I, I don't really know what that means. Would you care to elaborate? Uh, well, at the time I'd have done anything at all that she said. I, I'd lost all sense of reason. And that's your definition of being in love, is it? I can only say that's how I felt about Margaret. She was... Well, to be honest, she was the first woman uh, I, I'd ever been to bed with. And, well, I'm sorry if that sounds naive, but I can't help it. Well, you lost both your, well, how should you say, your, your innocence and your head. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I am. And are you saying that you met the defendant, fell deeply in love with her, and even though you were a serving soldier, you, you immediately and instantaneously changed all your ideas and attitudes and became a complete pacifist? Well, it wasn't exactly like that, no. Well, what was it like then? Well, I, I met her at a garden party at her parents' house. I was immediately attracted to her. I liked her very much indeed. I, I saw her again the next night and, well, with only, in only a very few days, I was completely besotted with her. I'd never met anyone like her ever before. And before long, she had more or less completely persuaded you round to her way of thinking about war, about the army, about everything, in fact, that you'd so far accepted unquestioningly and devoted your life to her. Yes, she had, completely. But, Mr. Ridley, if what you say is true, and the defendant really totally persuaded you that your way of life, your whole career in the army was wrong, why didn't you simply apply to resign your commission? Because I joined the army on a short service commission with an option to leave after two years. At the time, I'd served less than one. And Margaret said that would be a coward's way out, that coming from a military background, I should take a stance and make a public gesture against my family. And desert? Yes. Mr. Ridley, I, I put it to you that the defendant did no such thing. She suggested you make a public gesture, yes, but by stating that you were a conscientious objector. No. She suggested I should desert, and that she would hide me in a flat if I did. I further put it to you that you yourself deserted. And when you tell her you had done so, because she loved you, she offered to hide you in her flat, which may not be legal, but was done on the spur of the moment to try and protect you. I am suggesting that that was how it was. It was that way round, Mr. Ridley. You deserted, and because she loved you, she offered you her help. And at very great risk to herself. No. Why should she? She never really loved me. All the time that I knew her, she never told me. But I know that she was in love with someone else. That's a very harsh thing to say of someone, after you've had a love affair with them. I believe it to be true. The case of the Queen against Anderson will be resumed tomorrow in the Crown Court. Yesterday in the Crown Court, Margaret Anderson was charged under the Incitement to Disaffection Act with trying to seduce Peter Ridley and other serving soldiers from their allegiance to the Queen. 
by encouraging them to disobey orders, to refuse to fight and to desert from the army. Prior to this trial, Peter Ridley was found guilty of desertion by a court-martial and was dismissed from the army by that court. And you two are in the 1st Battalion, the Royal Darsham Fusiliers, and are stationed and live at Milton Hampton Barracks, Fulchester, Captain Crichton. Yes, I am. Did Peter Ridley, at the end of June last year, do you remember, tell you about a young woman he had at that time recently met, the accused, Margaret Anderson? He did, yes, at great length. Well, without necessarily trying to remember anything specific that he said, did you form the impression that he'd fallen very much in love with her soon after meeting her? He was head over heels in love with her. He was almost like a schoolboy. He could think about no one else and talk about no one else at all. And when you met her, did you and she, shall we say, did you get on? Oh, yes. We always have, quite well. We had arguments all the time about everything. But on the whole, I hope she'd agree. There was never any great personal animosity between us. Mm. What sort of arguments were they that you had nearly all the time, as you say? Well, they were political and religious, chiefly. But I don't think our views coincided on a single thing ever, really. Political? She was always very hot on disarmament, socialism, ecology and all that sort of thing. Did what she say make any impression on you? Did it, did it make you alter your own views in any way at all? No. I never took her seriously. She was a typical, woolly-minded, middle-class liberal. The sort who react emotionally to everything, but never sit down sensibly and think things out. Now, Captain Crichton, we come to this leaflet, Exhibit 1, Headed soldiers, make peace, not war. May the witness be shown a, a copy of it, please. Now, do you recognize it or one very like it, a, a copy of it? Yes, I do. Where have you seen it before? At Margaret's. She showed it to you? Yes. Captain, did she make any specific request concerning it to you? Yes. She said, would I take some to the barracks and leave them lying around so that people could see them? And what was your reply? Well, actually, I laughed. Yes, did you say anything at all? Yes. I think I said something like, Margaret, really, don't be so bloody preposterous. Sorry. Thank you, Captain. Captain Crichton, I suggest to you that the defendant said not, would you take some copies of the handbill and leave them lying around, but that you should take some. And you said them with a laugh and a smile as a joke, quite clearly not seriously expecting you to. No. I think she was trying to... Well, kid me into doing it. Almost dare me into doing it, if you like. But underneath, she was really absolutely serious about it. But the leaflet, the handbill you had there, Captain, you did feel no one could take it seriously. I mean, it was preposterous. It was a joke. No. It didn't affect me. It made me laugh. I didn't take it seriously. But I'm not saying that other men wouldn't have reacted differently to it. That's not what I'm saying at all. And because you thought it was such a joke, Captain, because it amused you, did you not put a copy in your pocket and take it with you the next day or a day or two later to the barracks because you thought it might cause similar amusement among your fellow officers? Uh, no, sir. I deny that absolutely. And did you not hang it up on a piece of string in one of the lavatories at the officer's mess? No, sir. I deny that absolutely, too. Oh, do you? Oh. Thank you, then, Mr. Cutler. Captain Crichton, I would just like to make one point completely clear, with your help, if I may. My learned friend has done his best to show that the conversations, the, well, the, if not quarrels, then certainly the arguments that you had with Miss Anderson were always good-tempered and amiable. Yet, Captain, roughly on how many occasions would you say they had happened? Oh, hundreds of times. Yes. Every time I was there. Captain, I'm sure it did feel like hundreds of times. But I wonder if you could be a little bit more precise, could you? Um, between the end of June and the end of September, let us say, roughly, how many discussions and arguments would you think you had? Oh, 20? Hmm, about 20. And how would you describe them fundamentally? As considerable and relentless pressure. Yes. Thank you, Captain. And what was that public house that you were in called, Sergeant Waxlow? The Minden Boy, ma'am. It's not far from the barracks and much frequented by the soldiers who are stationed there at Miltonhampton. It's generally regarded as what might be termed colloquially the regiment's regular watering place, ma'am. 
Sometimes it's very convivial, other times very quiet. And were you yourself in the lounge bar of it on the evening of um, September the 15th? I was, ma'am, yes. And was it, as you would say, a, a convivial evening or a quiet one? It was a very quiet one for me. It was the anniversary of the day my brother lost his life with the paratroops at Arnhem, ma'am. Were you on your own, Sergeant? Up until 8 o'clock in the evening, I was, ma'am, yes. And then did somebody come up and speak to you? Yes, that young lady there. The accused, Margaret Anderson. As I now know her to be, yes, but of course I didn't know it then. I'd never seen her before. Oh, of course. And do you remember the conversation that took place between you? Indeed I do, ma'am. I've never had a conversation of that sort in my life before. Well, can you tell us the gist of it? I'll try my best to, ma'am. She came up to me at the table where I was sitting on my own, and she said good evening or something of that kind. And I immediately replied that I was waiting for my wife. And then she said... Why Could did she... you say that, Sergeant? Well, sir, I... Oh, yeah. She had a drink in her hand, a glass of lager, I think it was. And she said she was waiting for a Lieutenant Ridley. And would I mind if she sat down at the table with me? And I said, no, of course, uh, by all means she could. You see, by that time, sir, I could see that she was not what I thought in the first instance. Yes. I think then she asked me if I knew Mr. Ridley. And I said, no, only by sight, that was all. And then she told me that, in her opinion, it was wrong to fight. After that, she I'm said... I'm sorry, she... Sergeant. Uh, are you saying that's exactly how the conversation went? She asked you if you knew Lieutenant Ridley and then said, I think it's wrong to fight. A total non-sequitur like that. I beg your pardon, ma'am. Well, I mean, it didn't follow on logically, did it? If she said it like that. Um, do you know Lieutenant Ridley and... I think it's wrong to fight. Do you see what I mean? I do, ma'am. I thought it was rather strange myself at the time, but that's what she said. Ah. Well, uh, however, uh, very well. Uh, how did the conversation go on after that? She then told me that she lived in a flat in Fulchester and would I like to go there some evening with some fellow soldiers from the barracks and talk about it with her and her friend. Then she offered me a printed pamphlet. Oh, uh, please. Exhibit one again, my luck. Yeah. Uh, this is it, is it, Sergeant? Headed, Soldiers Make Peace, Not War. Yes, ma'am, it is. When you say she offered you the leaflet, do you mean she offered it to you to read or to keep, or what? Well, first to read and then to keep. Then she asked me to take it with me. Take it with you and what? To show to my men at the barracks. And what did you reply? Refuse, ma'am. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, Sergeant Wetzler. As you told my learned friend, counsel for the prosecution, I think I have this right, Miss Anderson told me she lived in a flat in Fulchester and said, would I like to go there some evening with some fellow soldiers and talk about it with her and her friend? Is that right? Yes, sir. So after that point, at least, it was all very straightforward. She told you she was a pacifist and said, did you object to her sitting with you? You said no. And it was all perfectly amiable and polite, was it not? I would say so, yes, sir. And her invitation to you to go to her flat sometime and have a discussion with her? That was all it was. Just a polite invitation and no more than that. Well, to be honest, I, I would have to say it could have been that, so yes. Well, I'm sure you'd never be anything else but honest, Sergeant. Uh, what I'm saying is you, you didn't feel yourself worried or threatened by the invitation. I mean, you didn't feel you were in any way being pressurized into it. Well, uh, well, no, I didn't, sir. No. No, I didn't. Did you accept the invitation? No, I did not, sir. What did you say? Well, as I say, I said no. <laughs> Sergeant, I suggest you that you may well, as I'm sure you did have meant no, and that quite definitely, but uh, being as you are a very polite person, what you actually said was, uh, well, we'll see, or something akin to that. In other words, turning the invitation aside politely, rather than giving you a point-blank refusal. I don't remember saying those words, sir. Uh, you see, Sergeant, what I'm going to put you is this that after your polite reply, the accused then showed you a copy of that leaflet and said something like, show this to some of your friends so they'll know the sort of evening we're on. And she said it pleasantly and with a smile, not wanting to mislead or deceive you in any way. She was very pleasant and polite, I would have to say that, sir. You agree this is what she said to you? Well, I can't say that she put it in exactly those words, sir. In fact, I don't completely recollect how she did put it, to be honest. Well, Sergeant, you have been very honest with me, and I'm most grateful to you. 
And there is only one final matter I want to ask you about. This leaflet she asked you to take away with you and show to your friends, it was just the one, wasn't it? Uh, no other. I don't think I follow your question, sir. One copy of the leaflet on its own. I mean, she didn't offer you more than one, say 50 or 20 or even 10, and ask you to distribute them, to hand them round the barracks. No, sir, it was just the one. And didn't suggest you should leave that one lying around to be seen, but only that you should show it to some of your colleagues. Yes, sir, that's what she asked me to do, sir. Uh, and when she did, what did you say to that, Sergeant? Well, I said I'd rather not take it, sir. Thank you very much, I said, but if she didn't mind. And when you said that so politely, did she attempt to argue about it? Did she try in any way whatsoever to persuade you to, to change your mind and take it? No, sir, she did not. She made no further attempt at all to get you to take it? No, sir. As far as I recall, she put it back in her pocket and asked me if she could buy me a drink. Oh? And did she? Well, no, sir. I... <sighs> well, I said I'd be rather embarrassed if a young lady bought me a drink, and I hoped she would permit me to buy her one instead. <laughs> I see. So you were still on perfectly friendly terms, and there was no suggestion of any bad feeling between you? Oh, no, sir. I thought she was a very pleasant young lady, though somewhat misguided in her ideas. And did you buy her drink? I didn't get the opportunity, sir. It was just then that Captain Crichton walked in, and I could see they were well acquainted, so I made my apologies and went on through to the public bar, sir. Yes, well, thank you very much indeed, Sergeant Waxer. Thank you, sir. No, thank you, my lord. I don't wish to re-examine the witness. Thank you, Sergeant Wexler. You may leave the witness box. Sir? That's your case, Miss Travers? Yes, it is, my lord. Yes, Mr. Padmore. Uh, members of the jury, I'm not going to address you at this stage. I call the defendant, Margaret Ann Anderson, please. Take the book in your right hand and read the words on the card. I'm terribly sorry, I can't. I don't have any religious beliefs. Well then, Miss Anson, you must affirm, mustn't you? Thank you. I do solemnly swear, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Miss Anderson, have you ever been charged with any offence of any kind before this? No. How long have you been a pacifist? About three years. Ever since I was at university, it would be. Well, to emphasize something I put earlier to one of the prosecution witnesses in cross-examination, a pacifist is someone who is opposed to the use of force for any end whatsoever and to violence of any kind. Yes, totally. Always. And you yourself, to clear up one or two initial points about your views. Are you a communist? No, I am not. Have you ever been one? No, I haven't. Have you ever been a member of any political party at all? No, never. That isn't to say that you don't have political or other views, but you've never joined any party of any kind to promulgate them? No. Uh... You were going to add something? Well, I am a member of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and Friends of the Earth. Which I think I'm right in saying are both strictly non-political? Oh, yes. Nonsense. Silence in court, please. Miss Anderson, this is, of course, something you've never been able to get over to your family, isn't it? That to you, this is all a matter of moral principle, not of politics at all. Well, certain members of my family, yes. It's something I deeply regret. It's caused me much pain, and I'm sure it has them, too. Now, if I may, I'd like to take you to the main points of the evidence given by witnesses for the prosecution. And I'd like to begin with some of the things said by Chief Inspector Griffiths. Did you already know him, Miss Anderson? Were you acquainted with each other before the evening when he came to the flat with a warrant for your arrest? Oh, my lad, I don't know what my learned friend is implying here, but I hope it's not going where I think it is. Mr. Padmore? Uh, my lord, with respect, I think my learned friend counsel with the prosecution will find nothing to object to. 
though I'm sure she will object very promptly if she does. Yes, well, we shall have to see, Miss uh, Travis, shall we? Eh? Very well, my lord. Uh, Miss Anderson, please say how you are already acquainted with the Chief and Senator Griffiths. Uh, at this stage, I think it would be better if you didn't mention the name or names of anyone else. Well, I'd been to the police station only two nights previously, actually. The girl who shares a flat with me had asked me to go to confirm a statement she made to them about where she was on the Saturday night before. Well, without going into detail about it, it was in fact a confirmation of an alibi. She told the police she'd been at home in the flat for the whole of the Saturday evening, and you were gone to say you would confirm that. Yes. I don't think he was all that pleased about it. My lord! <laughs> My lord, I'm sorry. My client should not have made that comment, I know. And I'm not going to continue with the matter. Yes, well, I think we can let it rest there for the time being. I seem to remember you found yourself in a similar difficulty yesterday, Miss Trevor. My lord? Mr. Padmore. So, Miss Anderson, when you arrived back at your flat on the evening in question, having, as we've heard, been to a Chinese takeaway to get something to eat for yourself and your friend Peter Ridley, and you found Chief Inspector Griffiths there waiting for you, what was your first thought? That he was there in connection with further inquiries about my statement about my flatmate. Was there anything else at all you could think of that it could be to do with? No, nothing. There was nothing else I'd done. So when the Chief Inspector told you the purpose of his visit, and that he had a warrant for your arrest, what was your reaction? I was stunned. I couldn't believe it. Do you remember what you said? I think I said, you must be joking or something like that. And then what happened? It all seemed so silly. I invited him to stay and join us in a Chinese meal. There was no thought of trying to escape, to run away or anything of that sort? Well, as far as I knew, I'd done nothing I needed to run away about. No, exactly, quite. And so you raised no objections to Chief Inspector Griffiths and his colleagues searching off that? I can't say I was very pleased about it. And while this was going on, while the search was being made, did something in particular occur involving Chief Inspector Griffiths? There's a quite big table, our dining table, in the sitting room where we were. It's always untidy, and we had to clear a space on it to eat. There were piles of books and magazines and newspapers, and among them was a, a small pile of printed handbills. Were they hidden from view in any way, either deliberately or by accident, say, under a magazine or a newspaper or book or something of that sort? No, they were not. Well, tell the court in your own words, will you, what happened regarding them, please? He... Chief Inspector Griffiths. He picked one up and he looked at it and he said, and what's this then? And I said, I don't know, it's not mine. And next to them was a printer's proof of another leaflet addressed to deserters, just one copy of it. And he said, and what's this? And I said the same again, I didn't know, it wasn't mine. Miss Anderson, was that a truthful reply? Uh, not strictly, no. It was true they weren't mine, but I did know what they were and that I knew who they belonged to. Though you told him, in fact, when he asked you that you didn't know who they belonged to? Yes, I did. And it wasn't strictly true. Are you going to tell us now who's here? I'd prefer not to. No, of course, it being a matter to... Really, my lord! Uh, Mr. Padmore, I'm reluctant to interrupt, but is your client aware that I can compel her to answer? My lord, I should be calling another witness whom I'm quite sure would completely clarify this matter. Oh, well, if you say so, Mr. Padmore. My lord, Miss Anderson, your case is this, isn't it? That none of the material which is the subject of this charge is your property. Yes. Miss Anderson, your father has said, as you heard, that he was shown a copy of the leaflet by Peter Ridley. Now, how did he get hold of it? I've honestly no idea. I never gave him one. Oh, he saw one, of course, at my flat, but I didn't give him one. And I didn't even know he had one. Did you ever ask him to take any and either show them to or distribute them among his colleagues? No, never. Now then, Miss Anderson, I'm sorry if this is painful to you. But were you and Peter Ridley having a love affair? Yes. He had a key to your flat? Yes. So, for instance, he could have taken one without your knowing anything about it? Lud, that was never put to Mr. Ridley in cross-examination. No, it wasn't, was it, Mr. Fatmore? My lord, I'm sorry. I should have done. The fault's entirely mine. I won't pursue it. Miss Anderson, you were in love with Mr. Ridley. Yes, very much. Are you still? Yes.
I fell just as quickly, and I think as deeply in love with him as he did with me. And we'd only known each other a fortnight when he asked me to marry him. It was a terribly hard thing for me to have to say, but I told him I was willing to have a love affair with him, but that I could never, never marry someone who was a professional soldier. Now, I would like to get this very clear, please. Did you give him to understand that if he left the army, you would then marry him? Well, Peter, sorry, Mr. Ridley, he could have applied to uh, resign his commission after two years. And so I said that perhaps the second year would give us a chance to see if we still felt the same. And if we did, and he resigned, then we'd get married. Miss Anderson, did you ever suggest to him, or did he suggest to you, that he should desert? Never. Never, ever. It was never even mentioned. I was appalled when that's what he said he'd done. I couldn't believe it. I thought he was joking when he came back to the flat one night and said, well, I'm here to tell you now I've burnt my boats. I've done all three. All three? What did he mean by that? I didn't understand at the time. He said he meant the three things on the leaflet. Refuse to fight, disobey orders, and desert. You were appalled, you say? Yes, utterly. Why? Because I knew desertion was so very serious. Nevertheless, because you loved him, you offered to let him hide at your flat. Yes, I did. I think anyone would have done if it was someone they loved. Miss Anderson, I'd like to pass on now to the evidence given by Mr. Ridley's friend, Captain Crichton. Now, he said, you remember, that, that you showed him a leaflet and asked him to take copies to the barracks and lead them where people could find them. Yes. Oh, you did say that? I'm sorry, no. I mean, I remember him saying it, but it wasn't true. Not the way he said I said it. I said it would be good if he would, and perhaps one day he'd feel he should. But I never seriously expect him to him to. He knows that. You say that with absolute surety, but how would he know it? Well, because of our whole relationship. There was never a single thing we agreed on. We had jokes about it that we didn't. We laughed, and we said that one day we must find something we did feel the same about. I asked him once if he'd bring his fiancée round to supper, but he said he felt sure that if he did, we wouldn't get on either. So he never did, but even about that, there was no bad feeling between us. Yes. Well, thank you, Miss Anderson. Now, Miss Anderson. You and Mr. Ridley met. And within a fortnight, was it, you said you were deeply in love with each other? Yes. And he asked you to marry him, and you, you say, said you couldn't marry a professional soldier. But you suggested that the year's waiting time between then and when he could resign his commission would give you both a chance to see if you felt the same. And if we did, and he resigned, then we'd get married. I think they were your words, were they not? Yes. But, Miss Anderson, how could you have married him? when you were already married? Well, Miss Anderson? The case of the Queen against Anderson will be concluded tomorrow in the Crown Court. Margaret Anderson is charged in the Crown Court with trying to persuade Lieutenant Peter Ridley and other soldiers not to remain in the army. 
and to distribute leaflets calling on other servicemen to do the same. Well, Miss Anderson? Prior to this trial, Peter Ridley was found guilty of desertion by a court-martial and was dismissed from the army by that court. Margaret has stated that she would have accepted Ridley's proposal of marriage if he had not been a professional soldier. Miss Anderson, I'm still waiting. I said, how could you have married Mr. Ridley when you were already married? I'm not married now. My divorce was finalized six months ago. Miss Anderson, I didn't ask you that. Oh, let us approach it another way then, shall we? Both to your own counsel and to me, you said that you told Mr. Ridley that if he applied to resign his commission, then that would allow both of you a year's waiting period in which you could make sure that you still felt the same way about each other, did you not? Yes. And no, then you, you see, what I meant... No, Miss Anderson, please wait until I have finished. That is true, is it? That is what you said to Mr. Ridley when he asked you to marry him, that a, a year's wait would be of benefit to you both? I'd like to explain. Please, can I explain? Yes, you can explain, Miss Anderson. Indeed, you're going to have to in a few moments. But first, please, I must ask you, will you answer my question? My Lord, I do think my client should be allowed to say what it is he wants to say, and not to be bullied in this way. Well, Mr. Padmore, if you don't feel satisfied at the end of her cross-examination, that she's been able to say all she wants to say, I'm sure you'll bring it out in re-examination. That's my Lord, but I feel no, that... No, 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 I cannot agree. Counsel is fully entitled to press for an answer to her question. Now, do let's get on. Yes or no, please, Miss Anderson. Was your answer to Mr. Ridley's proposal of marriage that a year's wait until he could resign his commission would give you both a chance of testing your feelings? Yes. Thank you. And so you were telling your own counsel and me the truth when you said that that was what you said? Yes. And were you telling Mr. Ridley the truth when you told him that? Yes. The whole truth, Miss Anderson, or only a part of it? I knew that by the time he was able to resign, I would have been free because my divorce would have come through. Oh, Miss Anderson, you really aren't doing yourself any good at all, you know, are you? That isn't what I asked you. I said, did you tell Mr. Ridley the whole truth? No. At last. Thank you, Miss Anderson. So we've established that even with someone with whom you were deeply in love, you are not a person who can be relied upon to tell the truth. Yes, but I'd like to explain the reason I didn't no, no, tell Miss him... No, no, Miss Anderson, I'm not going to ask you any more about it, so please don't go on any further. Now, let us consider some of your other evidence. I would like to know from you, please, something more about these books that the police took away from your flat. No, wait. Please, they're not part of this charge, I know. And your counsel did try to give the impression that they were purely everyday reading matter, ob obtainable from any public library. But how would you yourself describe those books, Miss Anderson, in, in general terms? Reading matter of general interest to anyone at all politically aware. Anyone politically aware? Uh, you would include yourself in that category? Yes. Now, you're definitely not a communist, you say? So what are you, then? I don't like labels. Oh, neither do I. Still, will you answer my question, please? If anything, I'd say I was an anarchist. Well, I know to a lot of people who don't know anything about it, that's somebody who wears a cloak, throws bombs... So you'd and... call yourself an anarchist, Miss Anderson? Is that someone who doesn't believe in any form of government at all? Yes, up to a point. And who would like to see all forms of government done away with? Yes. And it was this form of political awareness, did you call it, that most of the books that were taken away by the police were concerned with? Yes. Only I'd just like to say that... The Anarchist's Cookbook was one we heard mention of. Yes. Which contained sections on such things as converting a shotgun into a grenade launcher, bridge destruction, and how to make a car booby trap. Yes. Tell me, please do how the possession of such pernicious and dangerous literature can be reconciled with your pacifist principles, which we were all hearing so much about. Being opposed to the use of force for any end whatsoever and violence of any kind. Because I possess a book doesn't mean to say that I necessarily agree with what's in it. A book? 
towards a citizen's militia with the diagrams on how to disable sentries, how to attack rail networks, attacking an airfield, destroying bridges. That was another. Yes, but as I say, I don't agree with it. And without a trace which, to quote its own introduction, provides essential information to those engaged in political actions at which they would rather not be caught. Yes. That was yet a third that you possessed, but you didn't necessarily agree with. Yes. Well, I wonder if you are telling us the whole truth about this too, Miss Anderson. However, I'd like you to explain to me now, please, some of the things you've said in answer to questions from your own counsel about Chief Inspector Griffith's visit to your flat. You didn't really know why he'd come, you said. You really couldn't think, but you thought it might possibly be in connection with further inquiries he was making about your flatmate. Yes. Miss Anderson, you had an army deserter in your flat. Did it not occur to you that the police might have come to your flat about that? Well, yes, I suppose it did come into my mind. So possibly. what you said about that wasn't the whole truth either then, was it? Not strictly, I suppose. Miss Anderson, we are concerned most strictly with the whole truth. You've just admitted that you did not tell the whole truth even to your own counsel. So what do you expect these ladies and gentlemen of the jury to make of the answers that you've been giving to me? But you're twisting my meaning. Well, there's certainly some twisting of meaning going on, Miss Anderson, but as to who has been doing it, we shall have to leave that to the members of the jury to decide. However, to continue, now you weren't worried either, were you, when Chief Inspector Griffiths came and there was a, a pile of printed handbills on the table because you didn't know anything about them. You said they weren't yours. But then again, you went on to say to your own counsel that that wasn't a strictly true answer either, was it? Because you did know who they were, but you just weren't going to say, were you? Miss Anderson, I'm sure you're beginning to appreciate my difficulty and even more that of the members of the jury. It's becoming more and more difficult for any of us to know which of your answers is strictly true and which is not strictly true. And you see, when it comes to the point, Miss Anderson, when we have to decide whether to believe your answers or that of the prosecution witnesses, the difficulty is very plain, isn't it? I especially in such instances as these. I honestly have no idea how Peter got hold of the leaflet. I didn't give him one. I didn't even know he'd got one. Now, when you gave that answer, was that strictly true or not strictly true? It was true. And when Captain Crichton said that you had asked him, would you take copies of the leaflets to the barracks, but you maintained that what you said was he should take them, now, was that strictly the truth or not strictly the truth? I was telling the truth. Captain Crichton was lying. No, not lying exactly. No, he misheard me or he misunderstood me. I don't know which. I'm sure he didn't do it deliberately. Oh, no, because you and he were such good friends as you've been at such pains to point out. He was mistaken. Well... Shall we leave it to the jury to decide if Captain Crichton looked like a man to have been mistaken? Sergeant Waxlow, when he says you approached him in the lounge bar of a public house and asked him to take a leaflet back and show it to some of his fellow soldiers, now, was he telling the truth? Yes, only he misunderstood my meaning. Well, after your performance here today, Miss Anderson, I'm sure he can't be by any means the only person to have done that. No more questions, my lad. Do you wish to re-examine? Mr. Padmore. Uh, no. No, thank you, my lord. I call the defense's next witness, Jenny Mormon, please. Well, now, let us come to the heart of the matter, shall we? The handbill headed, Soldiers Make Peace Not War, of which 20 copies were found in the flat on the table. Now, where had they come from? I'd put them there, earlier on in the afternoon. 
Someone was going to come round and pick them up in the evening, and I told him I'd leave them on the table waiting for well, him. Well, what were they, those animals? And what were they there for? They were for an American serviceman. He'd just been posted to a base in Germany, and he'd asked me to get some printed so he can take them with him. He was going to spread them round on the base in Germany. Were any of them intended for distribution either by yourself or by the defendant, Margaret Anderson? No, they were definitely not. At Exhibit 2, the so-called mock-up of a leaflet giving you advice to soldiers about where to get help if they deserted, uh, what was that? And where was that from? It's what you might call a suggested layout, you see, made up from cuttings from two different leaflets already in existence. One's one prepared by the Canadian Peace Movement when they were helping American soldiers who deserted from Vietnam, and the other's Swedish or Norwegian, I'm not sure which. It's for American troops in Germany. And what was that there for? It was going to be picked up by the same person who was coming for the handbill. That also had nothing to do with Margaret Anderson in any way? No, in no way at all. Thank you. Well now, Miss Morgan, shall uh, we... Miss, please. Oh, I do beg your pardon. So, Ms. Morgan, tell us just a little more, please, about these exhibits which you still have there. Where had you got them from? A friend. A friend whose name was what? I have no idea. I really don't know. You don't know? No. They'd been brought to me that morning by a woman I only know as Frances, for giving to an American serviceman called Chuck. But I don't know anything else about it. Well, we know something about you, though, don't we? You're referring to the fact that I have previous convictions, I suppose. Being in possession of a firearm and conspiring with others to set fire to an unoccupied house in Wales. Those convictions are recorded against me, yes. It doesn't mean I was guilty, though. Ms. Morgan, the court has heard that two days before she was arrested on this charge, your friend and flatmate, Margaret Anderson, went to the police station and gave a statement to help you confirming that you'd been in the flat when you said you had. Is that correct? She told them the truth. It helped you. Yes. And now, you've come here to help her. I'm telling the truth about her. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. I don't wish to re-examine the witness, my lord. I call Father Brian Flynn. And you live in the Presbytery at St. Dominic's, Father Flynn, is that right? That is right, yes. How long have you been there? Uh, just six months now. And how long have you known the accused, Margaret Anderson? Well, just a bit six months, too. I, uh, I met her, I think it was the first week I was there. She's not, I think I'm right in saying this, Father, she is not of your faith. She's not. Uh, she insists she's not a Christian in any way at all. You would say that you and she were, what, acquaintances, friends? Friends. Very good, close friends, I hope I could say. How has that come about? Would you tell us? Uh, when I first came to St. Dominic's, I told Father Danson, who's in charge there, that I hoped I could build connections between the church and the local peace movement. Uh, Margaret and I got to know each other in that way. As a matter of fact, as I recall it, uh, she came round to the presbytery only a couple of days after I'd arrived and asked if she could hire the hall for a peace meeting. But... Uh, Father Danson said he didn't like the church getting involved in political things, so I had to go around and tell Margaret I was sorry. And from then on, I used quite often to go around to Margaret's flat and have chats with her and her friends. Is there one particular friend of hers you can recall meeting there? Yes, uh, a young army officer, uh, Lieutenant Ridley. Why do you remember him particularly? Well, he wasn't at all the boyfriend you'd expect someone who was such an out-and-out -out pacifist as Margaret to have. Did you and he have any talks together? Quite a few, yes. Well, can you sum up for us what, in your opinion, was the effect his friendship with Margaret was having on him? Well, it was certainly making him rethink his ideas about the occupation he'd chosen to follow, of being a soldier, I mean. And did the defendant ever tell you what effect their friendship was having on her? Yes. Uh, she said she wanted to marry him, and would, if only he wasn't in the army. And then, a couple of days after that, she said that he was thinking of resigning but it would take perhaps the best part of a year to be arranged. But she said that would be a good thing, she thought. Did she tell you why she felt it would be a good thing? Yes. Uh, 
she told me that, uh, in complete confidence, it's only because I have her permission to that I'm repeating it now. She told me that uh, she had contracted a brief and disastrous marriage uh, three years earlier at university when she was very young, but that proceedings for divorce were underway and would be complete by the time Lieutenant Ridley had resigned. Thank you, Father Flynn. Father Flynn, how old are you? I'm 27. And how long have you been in holy orders? Three years now. And you yourself, are you a pacifist? Yes, I am. And not long after you came to St. Dominic's, did your superior Father Danson advise you not to keep on going round to the defendant's flat? Yes. Now, why was that, Father? I think he thought Miss Anderson was getting me involved in some kind of political movement. <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of it or not, Father, but in answering my questions, why have you taken to referring to the accused as um, Miss Anderson, when in answer to her own counsel's questions, you constantly referred to her as Margaret? Is it because you're afraid I'm going to ask you some questions about your personal relationship with her? No. Why should I? You're not afraid? Good. Then, Father, indeed, are you still yourself in love with Miss Anderson? No. No. Father, isn't that why Father Danson, your superior, advised you to stop going round there? Because he was aware of the temptations facing a young priest? Well, if that's so, I'm not aware of it. it certainly was not expressed to me like that. Father, do you remember a conversation you had one night at the flat, or rather just outside of it, in the street, with Peter Ridley, as you were leaving together? Well, we very often had conversations together. Do you remember Peter Ridley saying to you that he didn't care for the way you looked across the room at Margaret, when you thought that other people weren't noticing because they were talking? Look, it was absolutely Father, innocent. Father, answer please. Do you remember him saying that? Yes, but I didn't for a and moment Father, take it seriously. Father, do you also remember his saying on the same occasion that he felt Margaret was far too taken up with you and talked about you when you weren't there almost as if she herself were in love with you? If that's so, I deeply regret ever having given him cause for such thoughts, such painful thoughts and uh, suspicions. So you did give him cause, you're saying? If he felt them, I must have done, but I swear, not wittingly. I did, I, I, I tried to conceal it entirely. Thank you, Father. Uh, no, thank you, my Lord. This is the defendant's case, my Lord. My lord, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I told you in my opening remarks that the prosecution felt the evidence in this case to be both clear and straightforward. And that is still the prosecution's view. Let me remind you of the wording of the charge against the accused. It is of endeavouring to seduce soldiers from their duty and allegiance. Can you have any doubts at all, after what you have heard, that that is repeatedly and consistently what she has done? Margaret Anderson has every right to hold to her pacifist views, however mistaken you may feel those views to be. But members of the jury, she does not have the right to persuade men of Her Majesty's forces to take steps to put them into practice. She denies everything, of course. But when it comes to whether you can believe her denials, let me just give you one example of her dishonesty. I'm sure you will remember it. She said to her own counsel, not to me, but to her own counsel. Now, members of the jury, I'm going to say to you, not that she lacked honesty, but quite the reverse, that she was completely honest. When I said to her, I said to her, no one was trying to force her into an admission. Was that answer you gave Chief Inspector Griffiths strictly true, Miss Anderson? Immediately she said, 
hear an open court, for everyone to hear. No, it was not. And then, without hesitation, went on to say why. And yet, because of that, my learned friend will have it that everything else he says must be disbelieved. Well, I would say to you, members of the jury, that it demonstrates the entire opposite, that it shows her to be someone of very great integrity. And now let us consider some of the other things that the prosecution has brought forward. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have heard two most able speeches by learned counsel, and it is now my duty to say to you such things as I think may help you, not only in reaching your decision, but also in making clear to you those points of law which you must take into account in your deliberations. And when I have done that, you will please retire elect a foreman to speak for you and consider your verdict. Now let me summarize the main points at issue. Most importantly, it is not a question of where your sympathies lie. Whether you are in agreement with the defendant's views or totally opposed to them. The question is simply this. Has the prosecution succeeded on the evidence placed before you in proving its case? Did the defendant, or did she not, do the things that she's alleged to have done? If so, has the prosecution proved it beyond reasonable doubt? If yes, you must convict. If no, you must acquit. Bearing in mind that if you are uncertain, you must give the defendant the benefit of the doubt. It's a matter for you to decide, not for me. All stand. The prisoner will stand. Members of the jury, will your foreman please stand? Please answer this question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict upon which you're all agreed? Yes. On the count of indictment of endeavouring maliciously and advisedly to seduce soldiers, namely Peter Ridley and William Waxlow and others unnamed, from their duty and allegiance to Her Majesty, do you find the accused Margaret Ann Anderson guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. And is that the verdict of you all? Yes, it is. Margaret Ann Anderson, you are free to go. All stand.